I'm excited about this, not just this conversation, but also Untold on Netflix does a good job. And I really want to see the layers that I missed while it was happening on Johnny Manziel because it seems like it was great to be him and it seems like it was awful to be him. And I feel like we got an incomplete picture because he got grabbed by TMZ and the fame monster and he was very young. And then he gets ransacked by the whole thing. And it felt to me while I was watching it, man, this guy might be struggling with some mental stuff that isn't being made any better by how we're treating him as a society, as a social media, when he's not yet an adult. So I don't mean to speak for him, but Johnny Menzel is with us. And I'll start here. Thank you for joining us, Johnny. Is this the place where I'm going to finally get the Manziel story that has all the layers where I can understand it a little bit better than I understood it while it was happening? Yeah, this this will be a little bit uh, a little bit different view that a lot of people got to see in the past. Um, like you said earlier, I think Untold tells a great story. Um, after watching this a couple of days ago, um, but yeah, I definitely feel that that's that's what you're going to get. What were the parts where you got emotional watching it? I think just a lot of the stuff that has to do with my family, you know, um, you know, during those times, 2013, 14, going through the whole process of everything, you know, I don't know how much I was really aware because of, you know, just living my own life and, you know, struggling with things on my own, but how much it affected my family and uh, just the people closest to me um, in my life. So, you know, looking back at it now to see, you know, how they handled it, how it was for them, um, you know, definitely made me a little emotional. When was it fun and when was it dark? Like, can you separate these things and looking back at it? Or was there a lot of darkness that then got fueled by booze and was fun, but you realized that you were sort of self-medicating? Yeah, I uh, I don't think it really got to a point of where I started to feel mental health struggles until I got to Cleveland. So, you know, I'd never really had any bad times um, up until probably the fall of 2014. College was great then, right? You were having a great time in college. It's all your dreams come true, yes? Yeah, it was, for sure. And did you get the hurt of the machine is using me? I'm making tons of money for this school and I'm not getting much of it. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure if that's how I felt at the time. Um, you know, I think I had just at that point in time outgrown college station a little bit to where, uh, being in a town like that just was, you know, it was hard to move. It was hard to breathe. It was hard to go to class. That's why I took online classes during, um, my second season at A&M. Um, it was just really like being a, a shark in a fish tank at, at some point in time there. What happened once you got to the NFL? You enjoyed college, but that was your lowest time, you're saying. So what happened when you got to the NFL? You know, I think, um, you know, during my time in Cleveland, I think, you know, getting there early on, I was, you know, I lost confidence in my ability to be able to go out and do what I had always done really easily, really well. And, uh, you know, when you're struggling in, in your game and then you take it and you, you know, the football side is not going the way that you want it to. And then your home life, and what you're doing, um, you know, when you're sitting by yourself and when you're trying to get away from the game of football, when that's just as big of a struggle as what you're dealing with um, on the field, you know, you just wake up every day and you're kind of going through a 24-7 struggle. And at that point in time in Cleveland, I don't think I really knew that I was depressed. You know, I don't think I knew uh, much of anything about a mental health struggle or that that was even a real possibility. Well, explain this part to me, though, Johnny, because college is great and you're not exploring any of these things. You're a kid. You're having fun. All your dreams come true. But at some point you were diagnosed as bipolar, correct? Yeah, this wasn't until 2017. And so what was happening before then? There was no darkness in college. There wasn't any issue where you would have to be introspective uh, because everything felt fun and great. Yeah, no, I, I didn't have to be at all. You know, I, I just was you know, so in the, in the flow of things that, you know, I never really had much time during those times at A&M to, to slow down. I, di I didn't really slow down. It was, um, you know, full blast all the time. And I didn't have a, I didn't have a chance then to just sit back and reflect and, um, you know, feel introspective like that, or even go back into anything. So you weren't dark. Is it possible? Like, it sounds like what you're saying is the burden of being a professional quarterback in Cleveland is what essentially revealed to me that I was bipolar. You know, I don't think I found out um, that I was bipolar until, you know, a later date and time. 
you know, I think if you ask my family and people who observed me um, during the years before, I think they would have they would have told you that they saw signs of of things here and there. Um, but I think just the lull of life, you know, coming down from such a high um, has nothing to do with being in Cleveland or this or that, because, you know, the year after when I'm living in L.A. for the next couple of years, um, I think that's where it started to poke its head out a little bit more. Um, so I, I wouldn't say, um, that I really figured out the majority of these struggles until I had gone out and lived some life, um, and been away completely from the game of football for a while. Did you have a drinking problem? You know, looking back on it now, I think I definitely did at that time. You know, I was just nonstop blowing and going and, um, yeah, it, it wasn't, it wasn't good for me. It wasn't good for, you know, being a professional athlete and, uh, you know, I was doing anything that I could to try and get out of my own reality and out of my own head um, for any period of time um, that it would allow me to. What did you imagine your pro career going like when you got there? And how soon did you realize I'm ill-equipped for what's happening right now? I'm not studying enough. I'm not doing the right things. Um, you know, I felt like when I came back uh, my second year in Cleveland, you know, early on in the season, you know, I, I felt like I was playing better. You know, a guy in Josh McCown got to Cleveland with us that year and instilled a ton of confidence in me. Um, he kind of got it back to where it was fun to be in the quarterback room and be able to go um, play football. And, you know, not until the end of that season with how that season went for us um, did I think that it was going to go any differently? So, I mean, even after having a bad rookie year, getting in late in the season, you know, playing six, seven quarters of football throughout that whole year, you know, I still had a lot of confidence that I was going to be able to right the ship and be able to do um, the things that I needed to go be a good quarterback in the NFL. Um, you know, obviously that didn't end up happening, didn't end up transpiring, but um, you know, I had confidence all the way up until probably midway through the 2015 season. Untold Johnny Football premieres tomorrow. I'm really looking forward to this because this guy's story is interesting, and it sounds like he gave it all up. It sounds like he can look at it in retrospect and learn some things that he didn't know at the time. Leaving football or being done with, jo uh, with football, Johnny, a relief? Or did you look at it and say, ah, I wasted a chance. I could have been better. Yeah, I mean, I have nobody to blame uh, for this situation other than myself. You know, it was completely up to me to go do the right things. And, um, you know, I did it. So looking back now, years later, um, you, you know, it's a great question. It took me a long time to really understand that there's more to life than just playing the game of football, that there's more to life and that you can be happy doing other things um, other than throwing a pigskin around. So. Um, I'm, I'm more at peace with it now. You know, I'm able to, to still watch the game, still able to be, um, you know, a fan of the game of football. Um, and that's what I want it to be. You know, I don't want to feel like I did a couple of years after I left the NFL and be mad at the game and maybe be a little bit jaded. Um, so, you know, life works in funny ways. Sometimes the way you think it's going to go is not necessarily what you're meant for. Um, and, and there's more to life, you know, so um, I'm, I'm happy now and happier than I was um, during during those times, for I, sure. I appreciate the gratitude and the perspective, but I want to try and pin you down. Leaving football, is it a relief to you? Or if you had to choose from between the two, do you look back on it and say, man, I wasted a golden opportunity, or is it a relief because now yeah, you're yeah. – of, of course, of course. There's not there's nothing worse than, than wasted talent, you know. You can't say that, you know, what I did during my time in college um, didn't have an immense amount of talent. So – you know, it, it is a little bit of a relief, but at the same time, um, you know, you still live with some regret and being mad about how it how it played out. Johnny, did you really think the wig, the mustache, those things, that disguise was going to work in Vegas? Did you? I mean, <laughs> I, uh, you know, there's no way. I don't, I don't really, that that whole time, you know, the end of Cleveland for me, you know, that year was such a tough year. I think I would have done anything um, to to get out. So. Whether I thought it was going to work or this or that or not, you know, that was the first time where I was really willing and, and ready to do absolutely anything to get out of uh, the situation that I was in. Put us in there then. Put us with you at whatever that is where you're saying, I need to blow off some steam in Vegas because I need to get away from this poison. This is not healthy for me. What What is happening in your life the days leading up to that? 
Um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure towards the end of that season, you know, I was injured, so I wasn't playing. It was our last game of the season. Um, you know, my mindset was Fuck it, get out of Cleveland. Maybe I won't ever have to come back here. Maybe I'll get cut. I won't have to, you know, I won't even have to step foot back in the city again. I felt while some of that was happening, Johnny, tell me if I've got it wrong. You may be too young. Charlie Sheen, when he was disintegrating in public, it felt to me like that's what was happening with you, that you're a rich kid. The media is just pounding you. You're looking like the face of privileged irresponsibility, throwing away a great opportunity. And I'm thinking as I'm watching it, this dude's not well. He needs some help. He needs some people. And I'm sure they were reaching out to you. I'm sure your family was trying. But who's going to reach out and get this young man's attention so he doesn't keep, you know, setting himself on fire? Yeah, I mean, uh, my family tried their best. I think I just removed myself from everybody. You know, I removed myself from my friends. I completely went to a new place. And, um, you know, I almost feel for a point in time that, um, you know, I had so many people around me that were doing so, so much for me that I never learned any life on my own. You know, I never really did anything for myself or, you know, learned any lessons the hard way or had to deal with um, anything like that. So, you know, as much as somebody can try, you can always lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. So, you know, it had to be something that I realized on my own, you know, one day the party's going to end one day, this is all going to end. And you're stuck sitting there with just you and yourself. Um, and those times are, you know, what I learned the most from. And what did you learn? What can you tell us that you learned that gives you a new perspective in adulthood? Because I imagine all of that, what we're talking about, changes you profoundly. Yeah, it does. Um, you know, I think for a while when you're when you're young like that, you think everything's going to be, you know, for, for where I was in life, life was easy. You know, things were good. You have people kissing your ass all the time. Um, you know, you're the talk of the town. You're this, you're that. Um, and when you get internally with yourself, when you can't look in a mirror, when you can't, um, you know, when you get to a point where you start to see struggles in life and the whole, you know, house of cards that you have around you is kind of just falling down. Um, you know, when you get to a point in your life where you can't even walk by a mirror, you can't look at yourself, you can't really stomach the fact of what decisions you've made in your life. Um, and there's nobody else around the party's over all the fun's done all the people that are kissing your ass were gone um you know there's things that change inside yourself i don't know the best way to really describe it i don't think it was a you know a flip switching kind of moment you know it gradually happened a little bit more over time um but it, but it's hard to pinpoint exactly what it is you know um when you get so down that you want to uh you know, no longer be living on this earth and no longer living in this life. Um, you know, there are definitely things in your head and in, in the internal battle that, uh, you know, that change. Did the alcohol make that worse? Um, probably. I'm sure it had something to do with it. Because I can't imagine the kind of darkness that you were experiencing there and how grateful you are to have emerged from it. Because I think a lot of people are going to be surprised by this story, Johnny, and perhaps make you slightly more human than you've been. You've been a cartoon character for a long time. A celebrity cartoon character. Agreed. When you look back on it, were there many teammates who were confronting you about being a better leader, better quarterback? You know, at that point in time, no. You know, I think every opportunity that I've got over the last couple of years to be around my teammates, you know, I've, uh, you know, I've let them know the remorse that I have about how I was as a teammate, about how I was as a, you know, a worker in, in, in that locker room. You know, I have a lot of regrets about, you know, my second year at a and You know, we were a better team than, we went out on the field and performed. And I think a lot of it had to do with, you know, having your quarterback not be there grinding the way that he was um, the year before. When you, when you look back at like regrettable conversations and spots you had to put almost teammates in because they're trying to help you and cover things up. Like I saw you had other quarterback, another quarterback at Texas A&M taking and passing drug tests for you. Like what put us in there, that conversation asking a player to do that like it was yeah, that see, I, I don't I don't necessarily agree with that or think that happened whatsoever so 
you know, there may be a piece from, you know, my buddy's Nate side, my buddy Nate's side where he saw something like that or thought he did, but um, in no way, shape or form um, did that ever happen? Did I ever go to another quarterback or another person on our team um, and ask him to do that, to pass a drug test? So, you know, there's a lot that gets lost in translation. Um, this documentary is pretty spot on, but to kind of harp on that one thing, uh, that never happened whatsoever for one second at a &M. You know, Coach Sumlin, um, I will say, was hard on me. You know, he was strict on me, and he did, did put things in place um, for me to try and hold me accountable and, and do certain things. So I'll always be grateful for him um, for doing that. Johnny, you're quoted as saying, I have a deep hatred against the NCAA. Why? Um, you know, I, I think just the way, um, that they handled certain situations, you know, just certain stories that we've all seen from the past of what an impermissible benefit was of what, um, you know, certain stories that happened throughout the years that you hear about, um, just rubbed me the wrong way. You know, I think the current state of college football was the way that it is because of how, you know, the way it should be because of how big the business has got. Um, of college football, you know, it's one of the biggest draws, the biggest shows on television throughout the year, the money that's brought into it, um, you know, everything. It, it is um, better and and more correct the way that things are now being able to capitalize off a of name, image and likeness um, for people or the, for people that are bringing a ton of uh, monetary value. Untold Johnny Football, Netflix premieres tomorrow. Why'd you do it, Johnny? Why is it important to do it? You know, I think, you know, for me, I, I love the stories that Untold um, has been telling for the last couple of years that I've been watching. You know, I walk down the street every day and, and have people come up to me and be like, you know, are you still playing football? Are you this or that? Um, and it felt like the right time to eliminate, you know, questions that I get to tell my story to put a chapter of my life behind and be able to finally move on. You know, I, I don't want to, even though I'll deal with, you know, being Johnny football and dealing with the story for probably the rest of my life, at least, at least it gives me some closure. At least it allows me to, um, you know, move on to a different phase into my life. What's important for you, for people to know? Yeah, now I'm a, I'm a happier person. You know, I'm in a better place now with less than I was, you know, in the past with more. And, and I can sit here and, and say that, um, you know, I've got a smile on my face today. I've got gratitude. I've got my family. Um, you know, those are things that I can say I didn't have at one point in time in my life. What do you look back on when you look back at your college days and think most fondly about? You know, I think I'm very thankful for, you know, my university. I'm very thankful for Texas A&M, um, my teammates, I'm um, my coaches, you know, I still um, got to go live a dream for, for what I, for, you know, what I wanted to do as a kid, you know, what I wanted to do growing up to be able to go make the impact um, that I did have the amount of fun, win some football games, um, you know, win a Heisman trophy. Um, you know, for, for me, it was legendary. And for me um, sitting here today, you know, you know, I appreciate the ride. Johnny, because there were some positives, like winning the Heisman, as you pointed out, beating Alabama at Alabama, and your nickname is Football. I mean, that has to feel good. I mean, it would for yeah, me. Yeah I, mean, yeah, I mean, it does. Everybody and a, and a lot of people like to harp on the negative, and I think for a long time I did as well. But, you know, I sit here today, hold my head high with what I accomplished on that college football field. Wish I could have continued it on further into the NFL. Um and it just wasn't meant to be. Johnny, do I have this right? I'm reading between the lines. I feel like you went from college to the pros and you got to the pros and you're like, oh, this is a military school. I don't like the way this feels at all. This is not fun. This is responsibility. This is playbooks. This is pressure. This doesn't feel the same. This is a business. No, um, not, not the pressure, not the military style. You know, I grew up with that um, in my high school football program. Um, I'm not necessarily sure at that time that I really felt pressure. I really felt like I felt struggles in life. Okay. When you get up every single day and you can't see color and you can't um, put a smile on your face, when you can't do anything like that and you get to a point in your life where your head is telling you that you're absolutely drowning, has nothing to do with football, has nothing to do with 
anything, what team you're on, what the locker room is. You can't get up in your day and have a good day. Has nothing to do with anything else that's going on outside of that. Um, that's where I was in my life at that time. It wasn't me coming to a realization that, um, oh, maybe this isn't what I want to do or, or whatever the facts, facts may have been or whatever may look like. I was just struggling in life with people coming up to me and asking if I was okay. Me being like, of course, you know, I didn't know that it was okay to tell somebody, you know, I'm struggling. It seems like football players aren't really trained to do that part, right? Because I was reading stories this weekend. Werfs is moving from right tackle to left tackle in Tampa. He's great. He's great at what he does. And he needs to go see a team psychologist. And he's being quoted as saying, I didn't know I could talk about my feelings. I didn't know yeah. that that was a thing that I, I could tell people about my anxiety. Football does not welcome that exactly. No, and I think when I would meet people like that during my two years, you know, I was stubborn and, and not allowing myself to be vulnerable and be open um, and be honest about what I was really going through. You know, I would sit down with somebody like that and maybe say 10 words throughout an entire uh, meeting with somebody. Um, because I just couldn't do it at that time. How are you now? Like, does watching this back, does that bring up any of these dark places or is it like therapeutic for you? No, I don't think it brings up any dark places. You know, I'm in a better place today. So, you know, bringing this, you know, watching this documentary and seeing um, this kind of get portrayed, you know, I'm excited about it. You know, I'm happy about it. You know, I, I have ways of coping when I'm having days like that. You know, I have methods and things to do now um, that allow me freedom in my own mind. You know, I'm not a prisoner of my own mind like I was at one point in the past. Are you able to look back on these crazy fun times that you had? Like, like I, you've partied in Vegas with Gronk. Like, or are all these just negative memories for you now? Are you able to, like, pinpoint specific nights like man that was a wild fun night that, that is uh you're being a little absolute there <laughs> yeah i mean I, I i there were plenty of times i still look back to this day and be like you know that was a blast was that situation sometimes even you know even real life you know what a time but you know i, I only look back on things now as a positive um and, that, and that's really the way that I'm and that I'm rolling moving forward. What was the best night? Come on, paint oh, the picture. Oh, come on. See, I knew that's what you were going to do. I knew that's all you cared about. You have not been impressive in this interview. <laughs> it's too hard to pinpoint one. There, there, there's some great nights out there and and probably, you know, a lot that I'm going to have to, to keep to myself. That's what he See, wanted. There's something See, in there, no, Dan. There's, there's something in there. Thank you. That's why you're the investigative. You didn't get it out of him, That's no. why you're the investigative <laughs> journalist that you are. It's important that it's tell there, me, though. Tell me about the best party. Yes, he had a lot of great parties. Thank you for getting to the bottom of that excellent investigative work It was work cool by being you, you right? But he yeah, had no yeah, one yeah, pee for so him. Cool. Nobody then, peed for him. Yeah, but be clear on that. No one peed for him. Just be clear on that, you asshole. Uh, thank you, uh, Johnny. Uh, just before you get out of here, because I did not know this part. I did not, uh, I mean, that you purchased the gun to take your own life, that that you were fortunate that it just didn't go off the right way. You know, I can't really tell you exactly that night was a lot of a blur, but, you know, I did have this plan in my head throughout, um, throughout that year that that's what I was going to do. You know, I had no idea um how i was going to overcome um fucking up what i just up that year you know how do you go from the high of the high um give up all that you know you waste your talent you you know you ruin your nfl career you know your football career is most likely over you know what's next what do you you know you hear this with guys all the time but you know, life after football, people have a hard time adjusting to that. And, and really, when your whole identity, you know, is flushed down, down the toilet and you have nobody else to blame but yourself, you know, what else is there to live for? You know, how do you overcome this? You know, it, it felt like a point um, where I just wanted to give up and, and you know, disappear and, and not for just a, a small amount of time. Johnny, thank you for sharing your story with us, sir. And thank you again. I will tell the audience, Netflix, Johnny Football, Untold is the series. It's what was the best party? It's exceptional. Uh, thank you, Johnny. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you, boys. Have a good day. All right. Apologies for Chris's questions. You're good, bro. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Johnny.